Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for calling in today for our webinar, Media and Technology in Sexual Violence Prevention, presented by Ashley Mayer of Cal CASA. Before we begin, just a couple of items. Um, this is presented by WICSAP and the Prevention Resource Center. We provide training and technical assistance to programs around the state of Washington. If you want to learn more about us, please visit our, WIC our website at www.wixap.org. My name is Kat and I'm the Prevention Specialist. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email is prevention at wixap.org. Um, before we begin, I just want to let you know that if you have any questions, we encourage you to raise your hand. And there's a feature up in the top left corner where you can click that button. Um, I can uh, send you a chat and if you would like, you can, we can unmute you to ask a question directly to Ashley but we also um, can share all of your questions from the chat feature. You may have noticed you're not able to see each other's messages or chat amongst yourselves. Um, I can send you all messages and you can message me and I can reply to you though. So Ashley has asked that we will um, save a couple of minutes at the end to go over some questions, but if anything is really imperative, um, we'll make some time to address that during the presentation. Um, other things that you might be curious about, um, we will have all of the slides and a recording of this webinar available on our website within a week of today. You'll find that by going to our website, clicking on the Training and Event tab. On the left, there's a button that says Recorded Webinar, and it will be available there soon. Um, additionally, at the end of this webinar, you will have a, an option to do an evaluation. We encourage you to do so so we can find out how this worked out for you and if there's anything that you would like us to cover for future webinars. Um, and we will be providing through email um, a training certificate that is for one and a half hours. You'll find that it will come to you with a blank and you fill in your name and print it out. So if there's multiple of you on a call, you can print as many as you need. But because we do like to keep record of how many attendees there are, if there are more than one of you on a call, if you can just send me an email, prevention at wixup.org and let me know the other people who are on the call so we can modify our attendee list. Those are all the announcements that um, I have, so I'm gonna put up our first slide and turn it over to Ashley. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. Again, my name is Ashley Meyer. I'm with the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and I specifically have been working on the National Prevent Connect project, which is an online resource uh, for the prevention of sexual and domestic violence. You can learn more about Prevent Connect at preventconnect.org. So today we're gonna be talking about media and technology and sexual violence prevention. And this is something that I think we have really started to talk about a lot lately. Um, I have been fortunate to talk about it in a number of states, which means a number of different communities and audiences. I uh, recently, or a few, few months ago, last year, <laughs> so more than a few months, went to Hawaii to talk about this topic. I also uh, come from your neighbors to the south, Oregon, and I was with the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force, and we talked about this topic quite a bit. So we're just waiting for the, the first slide to come up. I think I'm going to ask um, Kat if there's anything I need to do to make that slide work, Kat. Um, if you double click it in the bottom view, it should appear. Okay, here we go. Okay, are you able, you're able to control that slide? I am and um, it'd be great if someone could just type into the chat if you see a slide that says media and technology and sexual violence prevention it has a blue bar. I see it, I see it, okay, great. Well, let's go ahead. So, we're going to start by asking, where do you work? So, if you can just click on the answer that fits your program where you're working these days, and if you don't see exactly where it is, if you could just click other and type that into the chat box, type your answer. And again, Kat, I'm going to ask as the person um, behind the scenes here, uh, are the audience able to see the results? Ashley, 
we were checking, we have we're having a few technical difficulties on our end. Okay. We well, should be able to see the results. Okay. So several folks are typing in that they can see the results. Thank you. That's very helpful. And so what I'm seeing here is that looks like the majority of you are from community sexual assault programs or dual domestic violence and sexual assault community programs. So it sounds like we have a lot of folks who are working on the local level. Um, it also looks like we have a few from, just a couple from the state uh, level and other types of programs. And again, um, let's see if any did, if you do, if you did type other, go ahead and type that into the chat. So some folks have typed in that they're with the state coalition, sexual violence coalition, looks like sexual assaults and also physical assault of children, LGBT cultural competence training program. We even have the Seattle Police Department victim support team here. Great, thank you so much for that. Now we're going to go to one more poll so we can all look at who is here today. So what is your community setting? So more specifically, some of you have typed that in, uh, but let's go ahead and just click the answer that fits you um, the closest here, whether it's urban, rural, frontier, or tribal. And I'm watching as the responses are coming in. Looks like it's a split between urban and rural, with urban currently winning out just slightly. <laughs> Okay, so we do have a, quite a, a varied audience here today, and I'm going to attend to that throughout the presentation. And feel free to type in the chat, um, even raise your hand if you would like to be unmuted to make a comment or ask a question, um, and think about specifically how this applies to your community setting. because. As we know, um, we want to make all information and all of our um, approaches very specific to our audiences, which we're going to get to more today. So it will help you if you think specifically about, well, how does this apply to me, the work I'm doing? Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next slide. So let's start about why. Let's start with why. Why are we talking about this? And this is a picture of my niece. She is um, two years old in this picture, and it might be hard to see, but she is, quote, reading Rifle Magazine. And so that's a picture that is meant to, to really point out in somewhat of a humorous way the fact that we really have media and the messages coming from it everywhere. Um, to the point that a two-year-old on vacation, not at my home, can find a rifle magazine and pick it up. And you might be thinking to yourself, but I'm not a techie, I'm not sure, I understand that this is important, but I, you know, it's, it's so complicated, but I wanna assure you, I'm not a techie either. I'm not someone who has a big TV and knows all the technology. You can look at this picture here and you can see that for several years I had about, I think that was a 13-inch TV um, that I played through a VCR to get it to work. <laughs> and only recently, a couple months ago, when I moved from Oregon to California, did I get rid of the TV. And now I don't have one at all. So hopefully that can um, alleviate any of your concerns about not being someone who's really up on technology these days. I also like to live simply. However, at any given time in my home, you will likely see two computers on and being used for a variety of purposes. You can add to that two iPhones in my home and then if you consider the fact that I also have a roommate who has an iPhone and a laptop and I have a work laptop as well, you can see that I have four computers and three smartphones in a relatively small apartment. <laughs> and so it's 
important to recognize that even as um, simply as someone like me would like to live, it's become quite a necessity for what I do. Um, and just to live day to day, to feel like I'm connected, to have these tools, to use this technology, um, even just simply to stay up to date on current pop culture. Um, so when I do my prevention work, I can know uh, what's going on. So let's do one more poll. And I want to ask you, what is your familiarity with media and technology? This is completely anonymous, and um, no one's going to know who the tech nerds are if you answer that you are a tech nerd. So go ahead and answer this poll, and we'll see as the results come in where we are as an audience, as a group uh, together here today. So it looks like the somewhat and quite a bit are the most common answer. So we have a large majority of folks here who know about technology or familiar with it and media, but they wouldn't consider themselves tech nerds. And they also um, wouldn't consider themselves completely uninformed. So only a few, only a few tech nerds here today, <laughs> so the very advanced in your abilities um, and your knowledge about technology. And um, I really do want to encourage all of you uh, to chime in when you can, to raise your hand, uh, to communicate with Kat through the chat box, um, and she will um, bring to light any of your comments or questions um, as we move throughout today's presentation. Okay. So think for a bit, do a little brainstorm about the ways in which you encountered media today. So think about your perhaps drive or bus ride or train ride or walk um, into work today, maybe getting ready for work. What did you come in contact with? Perhaps some of you woke up and immediately got on the Prez Hilton site. <laughs> um, perhaps you uh, have seen billboards, magazines. Maybe last night you watched a show like The Bachelor. It looks like some folks are talking about in the chat the fact that you watch TV news. Media is all around us. It comes in many forms, and it really, really impacts our daily lives. It impacts youth daily lives. It impacts the work that we do. So I'm going to keep coming back to the fact that some of you have asked me before this, you know, how can I convince my organizational leadership that this is something important. This is something we need to pay attention to. And a simple answer is, well, look at how it's already impacting behavior. So how can we use it to create, to reinforce the behaviors that we want to see happen, those healthy behaviors? Technology is constantly advancing. We have tools that are changing minute to minute. Um, as soon as I make a slide showing examples of technology, there's something new that comes out. So what I'm showing you here is just the tip of the iceberg. Apple, for example, uh, the makers of the iPhone, the iPad, MacBooks, um, change their product look pretty much I would say yearly, maybe even more than yearly, to the point where we can look at someone's iPhone and we can know if that's the new one or if that's the old one. Um, and this is, of course, because obviously they're trying to sell us something. And it also shows just how prevalent technology is in our lives. Because I'm sure some of you, maybe those three of you who said I'm a complete tech nerd, will likely be the ones who have that. <laughs> and when a new one comes out, 
we're going to see it as something that we need to be able to live these connected lives. And it gets to this point of marketing that we'll be coming back to again, that something is being sold here. So not only are messages being sold here, but even this, um, this consumption-based kind of status, which is really going to come up when we're assessing our communities and seeing, well, what tools are working here in our communities? And to pull out one type of media and technology that works together, very important in the work that we do, there's social networking. So from the most common, most popular, like Facebook and Twitter, which we'll be talking about today, to some more genre-specific sites, there are many, many degrees and methods for interaction. So something like Pure Volume is, tends to have more of a um, rock or punk subcultural audience. Um, whereas Instagram has quite a variety of audience members and it's based in pictures, others are based in music, and then some that have been very popular like MySpace are quickly kind of falling to the wayside. And you can do a quick Google search for did you know or go on to youtube.com and type did you know and you'll see a video and many iterations of a video that show just how times are changing and how rapidly. So for example, one of the videos shows that more video was uploaded to YouTube in the last two months than if ABC, NBC, and CBS had been airing new content 24-7, 365 days a year since 1948. So it can be pretty mind-blowing. And what was once considered standard, like floppy disks and hard disks, have now become kind of things to make purses out of, right? They're somewhat irrelevant now, and we're using them in very creative ways. So let's ask again, what's being sold? I think in our movement we've done a really good job of analyzing this, of looking at the messages that are out there and looking at, well, what kind of norms, what kind of standards for behavior are being put out there? Um, and what is this creating? How is this contributing to a rape culture, an environment that allows and sometimes even supports sexual assault and its related behaviors? But sometimes it feels like that's all we do. So I really want to encourage us all to think about how can we shift the frame? So we know there are bad messages out there. How can we shift the frame to get what we want, to get the good messages, the positive, the healthy messages that can really create those behavioral outcomes that we're looking for? Well, here is a useful tool. You might think there's so much out there, how do I choose? I, you just showed me slides with so many <laughs> different types of technologies and social networking sites. Well, I'm going to take you through a model that can help you do that, can help you make those decisions and really find what's going to be effective and what works for you. And this does tie into, if you're a rape prevention and education grantee, it does tie into some of your requirements. Uh, I know that you have a community development piece that you all do in Washington. In Oregon, um, we require and required, when I was there, community assessments and this continually, continuous quality improvement process. So this also is really in line with some of the funding that you all are getting to do this work. And to make it a little bit simpler, I want to pull out just four aspects of that model that I just showed you. And we're going to look at those specifically. So let's start with assessment. You're probably already asking these questions in the work you do, whether it's prevention, intervention, um, education. And it's absolutely key. We have to know what do we want to change. We have to look at the population. So who is it? who we want to create this change in, what population, what works specifically for that population, and then what are your options and what is your capacity? Because 
of course, there's the assessment of the population, so we can make sure that we are going to have be effective and reach those outcomes that we're hoping for. But the internal organizational assessment is something that we can't forget. We need to look at our organizations. We need to say, where are we even with prevention? Where are we with our technology use? Um, how we incorporate media, social media, social networking. Because an organization that doesn't know and hasn't taken the time to do this is likely not going to be effective then when you try to go outside of the organization and do something that's really consistent, realistic, um, and really on point with where the audience, where the population with what you're working is. So a quick detour, WICSAP uh, has really done a lot of work, um, it has a lot of materials for you all on considerations as you're getting into this, as you're using media, particularly social media and doing social networking, um, even working on your websites, your organization's websites. Um, some of the considerations, and as you read these, feel free to type into the checkbox other ones that you have dealt with or that you think about. So privacy and safety, of course, is something that we have to think about. This is the World Wide Web, right? And as I'm sure several of you who uh, appear to be familiar with things like Facebook know, those, uh, their standards, their protocols, they're changing all the time. So we're always hearing, uh-oh, Facebook changed something, you have to go in and make this slight little change to your settings so you can make sure not everyone has access to, say, your email address, something like that, your private information. Also, when we're putting things out there on the net, we oftentimes are losing control of our message, the organizational control of the message. So that's something to consider when we're creating strategies that use these tools. Are we willing to lose that control? Are we not willing to lose that control? And it's really an organizational decision. The information, as we know, lives on forever. And I think that there have been a lot of stories about even just individuals putting something out there and then, say, running for office or applying for jobs. Uh, it's a different world now where what we're putting out there is going to last. So we make a Facebook post or we write a blog about something, we might delete it, but the way the internet works these days, it's still going to be there somewhere and someone's likely going to be able to find it. As organizations, we also need to think about what happens if we have disclosures or requests for assistance. If any of you have Facebook pages, you might be familiar with this, uh, where you might have survivors posting a note saying, I need help, call me, or what do I do? You know, making disclosures in that kind of a format. And so we really have to have policies. Um, we really have to be prepared to deal with these things. And I know um, WICSAP and uh, CalCASA, a lot of us have media policies, sample media policies. And so that's something that you can look to um, WICSAP for, you can look to um, other resources to just look at what are some samples. If we don't have one that works for our organization and we want to explore uh, how we could create one, um, there are several resources out there for you. So getting back to assessment, let's talk about why. So again, your organizational leadership might be asking, first of all, why? Why do we want to use media? But also maybe, you know, oh, why, why do we want to go through this big process? Let's just go do something um, rather than spend some time doing an assessment. So I'm going to play you a very quick video, and I hope you can hear the audio. I'm the cool dad. That's that's my thing. I'm hip. I, I surf the web. I text. LOL. Laugh out loud. OMG. Oh my God. WTF. Why the face? 
Um, you know, I know all the dances to High School Musical, so. We're all in this together. Yes, we are. We're all stars. That's something you know it. So, could you all hear that audio that went along with that video? If you could just type into the chat, Kat, if you could let me know if you think it worked. Okay, so it looks like some people heard it and some people did not. <laughs> so uh, I'll just give a quick recap. So what are you saying? So this is the, from the show Modern Family. And what, this is Phil Dunphy, the dad. He has three children and he's saying, he's the cool dad, he's hip, he knows, you know, LOLs, laugh out loud. Um, he mistakenly says WTF is why the face. And then at the end they are showing him um, performing for his children a uh, scene from High School Musical where he's singing, he's getting the, the lyrics wrong, and he's basically not cool. And so it's just a, a quick way to show you that unfortunately sometimes this can be us. If we don't do assessment, we can turn into this dad who thinks he's cool, thinks he's got it, it's really working for those kids, but it's not. So we do assessment, it can really be boiled down to asking. Ask. There are several tools that can help us ask what we want to know. We want to know um, what are kids using these days? What's relevant for you? What motivates you? How do you identify, right? What can I do that's going to be consistent with how you identify um, that will encourage the behaviors I'm trying to create? So I really like tools that aren't specific to media, but they're really specific to community assessment. So the community toolbox is a great one, and you can just Google, just literally go to google.com and, and type in community toolbox, it'll come right up. There's also an organization called Rescue Social Change Group. And what they have is this functional analysis of cultural intervention. You can just call it FASI, they refer to it that way. And you will get the slides and be able to click the link to go to this. They have a lot of resources on this, downloadable PDFs. It can get very, very um, complicated. There can be a lot if you really, truly um, do the assessment to fidelity the way that, that they've created it. But basically what they're asking is the who, why, what, and how of your audience of your behavior change um, solution, right? The approach that you're using. So the questions are, who in the population is performing the behavior that you're trying to change? Why is the population performing it? What changes can be made to prevent the behavior now and in the future? And how can we communicate with this population effectively? And you'll see going to that site as a resource that there are multiple um, really in-depth questions that fall under these larger, um, broader questions. And why this, this worked really well, and it does because it gets to the fact that even within one community, you know, we could say something like youth, but within that, there are many, many subcultures. So here's an example from their literature, and again, this is called Rescue Social Change Group. And this is about the, I believe, the emo subculture. And so they'll use this tool, they'll use an assessment, they'll go in and they'll find out what different identities do youth, in their case, they specifically work with youth, have. And so if I'm trying to change a behavior, how can I fit my strategies with what they identify with? And it's been really effective. So let's look at an example and try to make this a little bit easier. So when you think about what change do I want to create, let's just pick knowledge about consent, a pretty common one. I want to increase knowledge about consent. Well, in what population? Here let's say it's boys between 11 and 14 years old in a community in Ocean Beach or in the community in Ocean Beach. Ocean Beach is fictional. In this case, in Washington, we'll imagine we're on the coast. What works? 
Well, you did a three school survey that indicated that anything that was online based on a smartphone, these children's um, resources are apparently pretty high and they all have smartphones <laughs> or TV based. Your options that you have available to you, well, you're in a coastal community, you don't really have access to TV. People have TVs, but there's no TV station there that you can really go to to try to, say, um, get a show or an interview or anything like that. You do have relationships with a radio station, in this case 94.9 FM, um, and so that's an option. Again, though, we have to think about the fact that that didn't come up in our assessment. So if we didn't ask that in our assessment, uh, we didn't get an absolute no, we might want to go back and find out, well, what is the relationship of this population to radio? How do they interact with it? How do they use it? Is it relevant? And then again, that capacity piece. So in this case, we'll say there's little funding for prevention, which we know is often the case. Um, however, you're lucky in this case to have a full-time prevention staff. So that tells you I do have someone um, on my staff who has some time and energy they can dedicate to this. I might not have money, but that is something positive that I do have. So this may look familiar to you. This is a diagram that shows the different spheres of influence that we can have when we're doing our work. And it is from the social ecological model. Um, I will go ahead and assume that you all are at least somewhat familiar with this. And if you're not, it's just the spheres of influence um, that we have when we're doing this work. So usually you'll see individual relationship, community, and societal levels. <laughs> and sorry, and, and um, this is a magical model that, um, that Chad Sniffin just pointed out in the text that yes, most of us, most of us have heard of this. So uh, what I don't have in here is the societal, societal level. That's simply for ease and time of this presentation. Um, and a lot of times when we're doing work on all these levels, particularly community level, we're also making change at that really more macro, broader societal level. But here we're going to just focus on these three. So think about this fictional population of boys ages 11 to 14 in Ocean Beach. And think about, well, how can we make change on the individual level? Something that we commonly do are presentations. We might also think, okay, they said anything on the internet, maybe we could do a blog. But when we look at presentations, we've traditionally done these in ways that haven't necessarily included a lot of media, haven't used a lot of technology. So let's try to rethink this. YouTube can be a fairly easy way and cost-effective way to take this presentation idea, the history of presentations, this really common strategy and activity that we use, and make it fit for this population that really wants to see things online. And with relatively little resources, I looked up today how much a flip cam, which is the camera on the right side um, as you're facing the screen, is $245 for the newest flip cam. <laughs> Um, so even if you couldn't afford that, a lot of people are just recording videos, as you probably know, um, on their phones these days and quickly uploading them to the Internet. So an organization like the Consensual Project does this. They have taken flip cams, YouTube, and just had access to a computer with an Internet connection and posted several interviews with folks who are, who I would probably call maybe pop culture people. <laughs> so they're popular, um, they're relevant for a younger um, I, population. In this case, most of what I've seen has appeared to be targeted towards maybe 20-somethings, early 20s. Um, and with relatively little money um, and just these few resources, 
they've been able to create a really quite dynamic presentations and conversations about, well, what is consent? Uh, what is healthy sexuality? What does it mean to you, famous person, who people are going to listen to? And so you could easily look them up to see how they've done this uh, by just typing, going to YouTube.com and typing in the consensual project. And to get some examples of who they have interviewed um, and how they have done this. So when it comes to blogs, that's another really simple tool. And I would assume, I would guess, based on some of the polls that we did, that probably several of you on here actually have your own blog, uh, or you've at least been on blogs and read them and kind of have a sense of how they work. So there are many out there for free. And when you get the slides um, from, from Kat on the WixApp website, you'll be able to go and look at those icons and figure out you know, how, what kind of blogs there are out there. I had WordPress on there, Blogger on there. There are a lot of different blogs. Everyone has their favorite. They all pretty much honestly work the same way. So you can pick one of many of them for free. You could do multiple ones. Um, you just create an account and you start writing. Best practice is to really keep this short. Um, I actually yesterday just did some anecdotal, I looked for some anecdotal evidence. Um, I went and it, not empirically in any way, but I counted on blog word counts um, to see. And I found that no blog posts were more than 600 words from what I looked at. So again, I've heard over and over again from say WordPress themselves, from the host of blogs to blogging experts, in general, we keep blog posts short. That's the best practice. You're gonna lose attention if people aren't gonna read a, a long blog post. Um, that's just the standard for blogs. And then sharing. You share everywhere you possibly can. And this idea is gonna keep coming up of the where. We need to ask ourselves where. Where are we doing this? I could spend an hour writing the best, most relevant, on point, um, blog post ever, and then if I'm not putting it in the right place for the audience I'm trying to reach, I'm wasting time and energy and resources. So again, think about why are they going to read it, and this all ties back into the assessment, and where are you going to promote it? Now if we look at the relationship level, moving on, Let's try to think about, again, tying it back to our hypothetical population. What is something we can do that's interactive? Something that's really going to promote positive relationships as we want to do at this level. Uh, perhaps get parents and youth working together, get peers working together, really promote those relationships um, that we know is a protective factor, something that decreases the likelihood that sexual violence will occur. Well, Perhaps we could do an online survey to fill out with uh, parents to fill out with their children. That's a possibility. There are lots of possibilities here. Um, maybe in a rural community we don't have the kind of um, internet access we need to be able to just quickly do a survey monkey or use one of those tools that's an online survey. So we might want to do something that's paper-based, something that works in that community. There are a lot of different possibilities for interactive strategies. You can see them on the screen. You might have a favorite out of these. You might have more. And again, feel free to go ahead and type into the, the chat um, examples or things that you might have used and found effective in your particular communities. The point here is that you're the one who makes it happen. You're the one who makes it interactive, who ensures that it's being used in an interactive way. Uh, as much as it seems that technology is taking a human component out of just life in general, <laughs> the work that we do, there really is still a human component here. It is necessary. And if we think of ourselves as facilitators, that is going to help us not take complete control uh, of whatever strategy, activity um, that we're using, but it will help us kind of shape it, um, maybe push a little bit uh, in the direction where we want to go.
And I just wanted to just give one quick example of uh, an organization, a movement that um, has really effectively used these interactive types of tools, uh, particularly it's through um, Google platforms, um, Google Maps, just lots of interaction, it's Hollaback. And so we actually have a board member of Hollaback on right now. So um, Chad, if you want to add anything into the, <laughs> into the chat, feel free. Um, but it's, it was, I think, really um, cutting edge. I mean, I think Hollaback was one of the first in our movements. They particularly focus on ending street harassment um, and have types of tools and, and strategies where it's from re literally hollowing back to um, this street harassment that happens day to day um, to also supporting each other and creating a community and environment where we're supporting each other, where we're saying sexual or um, well, sexual harassment isn't okay, catcalling, all of that, um, and really looking at changing culture through using this type of an online platform. Hey, Ashley. Yes. Um, when you were talking about blogs earlier, someone had chatted in. Um, I think David had mentioned that Tumblr has really become a huge blog, um, I guess, site, and that a lot of young people are really interested in Tumblr right now. I don't know if you have anything specific to Tumblr to add to that. Uh, just that I agree, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that, I put it on the slide as well uh, because I do know that's something that's being used constantly. It's, it's a very, um, I believe it's an easy tool to use. There's a lot of just reposting what other people do. It's not as... Uh, maybe involved as a kind of more traditional blog where you write more. It's, I would say it's kind of like a in between maybe Twitter and and a blog or, or even Facebook. It's, it's kind of in between. Um, and yeah, and from my experience, it is very popular. But again, it might not be popular in in certain um, subcultures of of use. And so it does still merit assessment. Um, I think it reminds me, thinking of these things reminds me of when I went to uh, a group of middle schoolers. I was um, watching a presentation, um, some work, group work that was going on there. And I just asked them and kind of assumed that they were really into Twilight at the time, the movie Twilight series. And they were like, oh, no way, that's for the little kids. And so, you know, no assumptions here, assessment, not assumptions. That's a really good point, Ashley. I was just going to add that uh, it seems like one of the popular aspects with Tumblr versus some other blogs, it has a really heavy emphasis on photos. Yes. And so it's almost like a melding of a blog and Flickr, like getting to share a ton of photos. A lot of times photos with, like, your own edited funny captions or other things seem to be a big trend on there. Uh, mm -hmm. It just seems like that is one of the things that has set it apart from other blogs. I absolutely. I think you're you're right on there. I see that a lot. There's a lot of photo sharing, and you know, even when when people do post, there's usually just um, a really short post if it is just text. So it is. It does seem to be a very visual mode of um, interacting, of sharing, of of having an online presence. Okay. And yes, David, um, we will get to the best practice of using visuals shortly. So if we look at the community level now, some of the common uh, media and technology approaches and tools that we use are things like posters, again, radio, social networking. Um, in our case, the population of 11 to 14 year old boys want a TV, but we only have radio. So that's great. And if we have a great relationship, we're probably really going to want to use that um, and take advantage of that relationship with that radio station. But if it's not relevant for that, those boys, for, for that population, then we really shouldn't use it. Um, if it's not going to work, why waste our time, our energy, our resources? And... Again, we want to think about where. I, I think that so often it's just um, tragic <laughs> to see people put so much effort into developing really quality materials, um, really quality 
uh, sites, things like that, but then they're not sharing them in the right places. They don't know the audience well enough to know where are they going to access this? What are our entry points? Um, and unfortunately, that's when something that really was really promising um, can tend to not be as effective as it had the potential to be. So again, where is almost just as important as what? So print media, because I know that not everyone has um, the kind of access that it sometimes requires to use some of these strategies that are more online, um, is still a viable option, particularly if we're in frontier or rural communities and, and you know, the, the dial-up connection there isn't very good. I've worked with communities like that um, as well. It comes with a few uh, best practices here. So the first thing is to test your messages and your images. I couldn't say that enough. Um, I think sometimes we don't test because we think, oh, we have to have this focus group where we pay everybody a certain amount to participate. I really suggest even informal testing. Um, use convenience samples. You, know, you are able to get um, your niece and you know the football team at the high school. Whatever you can get, obviously the best is to get random samples and things like that, but I think anything you can do to test that message, to try to find out if it's going to work for the population that you're, you're looking at, you're targeting or working with, um, is absolutely necessary. Because we don't want to end up with messages that really don't speak to our audience, um, that maybe we think look great, but frankly, we're not the experts here. Um, we're the experts on, on the topic, sure, but just because we think something's gonna work doesn't mean it is. Um, and we'll see some, some more examples of that in the next slide. Obviously, we want high quality and relevant print materials. Again, like I was just saying, we always want to involve our audience. Um, we've come up with a lot of different sayings over the years. I think nothing for youth without youth is an example. Um, you can, if you have any more, you can type them into the text chat. And I think that's because we really understand the community, the audience needs to be central to creating the strategies that will work for them. Um, persons of influence, the use of persons of influence is something that we're hearing more about today, but I think it's something we've always looked to do. So if we really know our community, we're going to know, um, you know, in one community, this basketball player uh, might, might be a great person of influence, or in one subculture, that person might work. But in another community, when we're looking at targeting another audience, that same person isn't going to work. So again, that assessment is key there because we're going to figure out, well, what is consistent with this population's identity? Um, you know, what really works there? And it, it, takes, it takes some time to figure that out. And that's a place where Rescue Social Change Group and their work um, has really been pioneering, I think, around looking at identity. And then never use it alone. Sometimes people ask me why I say this. I, um, so when I say never use it alone, I mean, for example, don't just make a poster and think that's the be all and end all of behavior change right there. I think that um, we're, a lot of us on the national um, scale, so no matter, you know, Washington, Oregon, wherever we are nationwide, I think we've all come to agree that comprehensive strategies and efforts really are the ones that are going to get us where we want to go when it comes to promoting sexual health and preventing sexual violence. Um, you know, we always have to think what's next. Uh, one poster might send a message, but is it really going to do the type of prevention that we're looking for? And we have to also think that community education is a component of prevention, um, but we're really looking for more comprehensive strategies. And Kat, feel free to interrupt <laughs> if there is um, any comment that is needed or question that is needed as I talk. I'm very open to that. Okay, thanks, Ashley. You're uh, all good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just <laughs> can't, can't necessarily follow the chat exactly um, as I'm talking, so I'm not ignoring anyone. Um, just want you to know that. <laughs> so this picture is just an example of watch out. Um, anytime we're, we're putting anything out there, especially in print, 
Um, it can easily be modified in a way that we don't want. Uh, so this is just an example. It was a billboard that says every 20 minutes, I think it's 20, every 20 minutes um, a child is diagnosed with, I think it said autism, but someone changed it to a mustache. So always keep in mind um, what might happen to your materials as you're putting them out there. Even though our hypothetical population um, probably wasn't really into radio or we needed to assess to find out more about their relationship with radio, I wanted to talk to you about that because I think it is a good strategy and it's something at least I know from my work in the Pacific Northwest and Oregon and Washington are not exactly the same, um, but a lot of communities, particularly I found in the rural communities, more rural communities, they had a relationship with their local community radio station. Um, and I found that to be kind of refreshing because it wasn't something that I had experienced as much um, in other parts of, of the nation. So the suggestions often for working with radio, and it, it definitely um, is something that I think applies beyond radio, but is really offering yourself as a gift, you know, saying, I have something here for you. Um, as uncomfortable as it might uh, sound to say, it's selling ourselves, um, really showing that, that we have something they're going to benefit from. So they'll pick up the story. And I have done this in a couple of ways. I think uh, one example is I was able to be featured um, in San Diego, California, about teen dating violence and prevention week, uh, basically because of the Rihanna and Chris Brown coverage. And I think probably a, a lot of you on this call right now might have had that same experience. And you know, I didn't want to use that, obviously. Um, I didn't necessarily want to go out there and try to have to talk about Rihanna and Chris Brown. Everyone was talking about it. Uh, I definitely didn't want to answer the types of questions they were asking me, but I was able to use that as an entree. I was able to have that be an entry point um, to using um, this tool, using the radio on the stations um, to get messages out there that I wanted to get out there. And I think if if you've ever done any kind of media training, oftentimes it basically comes down to get in and then say what you want to say. And so there's a lot. The Wellstone Institute, um, I went to a great training, media training they offer, and obviously Wixap has media trainings and things like that um, that can really help you figure out, well, how can I sell my message? Um, what are opportunities I can take advantage of um, to get out there on the radio? And then social networking. So I'm a fan of, uh, I think it's DIOSA or DIOSA communications for best practices, continually updated best practices for social networking. Um, they change just as social networking changes. Uh, anyone who has a Facebook page knows that we all had this big shift over to a timeline. And so that changed um, the kind of postings that we were doing and what our pages looked like and things like that. And so there are a number of sites, and this is just one. Again, you'll have access to it with when the slides are posted on the Wix app website that um, has a lot of great free resources when you're looking at social networking. Uh, it goes through different types, Facebook, Twitter, all of those um, that we've all mentioned on here. Some of the things that many of the sites that talk about best practices for social networking talk about is first, why? Why would you do it? So we'll just use Facebook as an example here because it's very popular, but why would you have a Facebook page? If you're only doing it because everyone else is, then I think there is some merit to that in you know, kind of getting on board with what everyone else is doing and trying to stay up to date and relevant. But if you don't have a, a deeper or stronger answer to that why question, why you're doing it, how is this going to help the work that your organization is doing, then you're probably not going to have a very high quality Facebook page and people probably aren't going to use it. Um, you know, it's just not going to be that effective. You also have to think about things like time. You really do have to have time because as best practices show, updating continually every day, sometimes multiple <laughs> times a day, um, depending on the site and the tool, what's recommended, can 
really be essential to the effectiveness of what you're creating here in terms of your online presence through social networking. There are different guidelines for quality post, which basically is, um, as David had mentioned, some places say use visuals. I'm going to show you. I got some information from Facebook where they definitely suggest using visuals all the time. Um, some people like to just quote, paste, you know, copy and paste a whole bunch of um, statistics on their site. So you have to think about, well, why am I doing that? What am I trying to, to change or create by doing that? Or am I just doing that because I feel like I have to have something on this site? And so it has to be really intentional, and what you're putting on there has to really look towards what kind of outcomes you are trying to create. There's always a conflict with the personal versus professional in terms of sites, and honestly, I think that that's really up to your organization, how you want to handle that. Do you want employees to stay on Facebook, be friends with each other? Um, some organizations and businesses don't really allow their, their uh, staff to participate in a personal way on um, social networking sites such as Facebook. And we've probably, mo most of us have heard stories about how people have gotten fired also for their personal participation in social networking. So that goes back to that detour we took about some of those considerations. The social networking, as I said before, is just so very, very free that it really is usually a really great option for a lot of us who don't have a lot of resources but want to have a strong online presence. And so I, just about one or two months ago, I was fortunate to be able to participate in a web conference that Facebook itself put on in partnership with Constant Contact, which is another uh, tool that we all have. A lot of us use it for online newsletters um, and managing those. And they put on a webinar together, and it was pretty simple. Their keys to success were pretty simple, and I think that they can apply outside of Facebook as well um, in terms of just in general your online presence, your presence when it comes to social networking. And their big message was to interact. You really want to interact, which I think for us can make us uncomfortable because do we as an organization really want to put our opinion out there about something officially? Um, and their answer to that would be yes. They would say, and they said, interact, respond to people as they post to you. Um, use a personal, you know, use I statements, right? Um, talk about uh, what your organization feels about something. So that was, that was kind of a surprise to me because I think we do hesitate as organizations, and we have to. We have to consider um, our organization's reputation, <laughs> reputation <laughs> as we're doing um, this kind of online um, work. And so consistent with what David had said, um, post visuals, they really highlighted the fact that what they found in their research, and they've done a lot of it, is that particularly on Facebook, people use it and you get more impressions and these words that they use specifically if you're posting visuals. People will pay more attention to you and to your site if you are posting pictures, um, maybe charts, things like that, things that use visual learning and can really catch people's attention that way. And then they also talked a lot about advertising, uh, and I don't necessarily want to do an infomercial for Facebook right now, but um, they do have a lot of advertising tools, and so this is just one example of um, how you can learn how that might be useful for you if your organization um, has the resources, it's something like $25 for a few days to advertise and to have targeted ads on your Facebook page that go out to um, different users of Facebook. You can click on this uh, and watch a five-minute video that gives a practical example and walks you through how someone was really successful in using that option on Facebook. And Ashley, do you see what, the, um, what David just posted in the chat here? Let me see. Say it out loud. He said that he's heard that face, the Facebook algorithm prioritizes photos that are uploaded to Facebook directly rather than those that use a link. So in order of relevance, the algorithm promotes based on like comments, shares, likes. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't, they talked some about their algorithm, but they tried to stay away from that. Uh, but I, I can say I have heard that before, that um, 
rather right rather than sharing a link, the more that you actually add kind of personally placed on your page, uh, the more attention it's going to get. And they also keep changing that <laughs> for for organizations as well. So they've now come to a point where um, I've I've come in contact with some organizations who have gone to a place where they are being asked to pay now to have what they're posting kind of put out there and seen by more Facebook users. So that's something that is continually changing. And I would look to something like um, Diosa Communications to tell me what's going on, right? What should I do now that that's changing as well? But I have heard that. Okay. All right. And now let's get to the testing piece of this. So I'm sure you hear, uh, as, as we all do, because we believe strongly in it, about evaluation. And this is pretty much what that gets to. It's evaluation of our work, in this case per particularly of our media and technology approaches to sexual violence prevention. So we can have typical process measures, and process are basically things like, did you like it? You know, was the online room too cold, right? There are those in, when we're not online, we ask things like, um, did you enjoy the presenter's presentation? Did the presenter seem to know what she was talking about, right? Things like that. Was it good? Um, but you really can test for outcomes here. You can measure, did I create the change I was hoping to? And you can do that in creative ways. And Wixap also has some resources that I have seen um, and has done some, some training as well on what are some ideas for how we can measure outcomes uh, of our online strategies. And so some examples are things like if you're, if you're tweeting, which um, you, you know, are posting really short, uh, opinions or links or facts about things via Twitter on your Twitter site, well, people can share that. So I wonder how many times has my post about um, our upcoming prevention training, right? How many times is that being shared? Um, there are all sorts of different sites that you can find, some you pay for, some you don't, that can measure this for you, or you can frankly just count it yourselves. Um, it, it depends on what, again, your organizational capacity is. But the same with Facebook, how many followers do we have? There are just a lot of different ways that some of you probably have figured out. I would assume that some of you are using these. Um, to, to look at, well, we're going to say that we want an outcome of um, maybe this many people liking our page within two months or this many people sharing our new resource on sexual violence prevention. You can measure that, and there are a lot of different ways to do that, whether it's directly through the site or if you go ahead and use some of these new businesses, really, who have um, put themselves out there and created ways to easily track what's going on on these different types of sites. You can look at content analysis, so kind of like qualitative um, approaches to evaluation. You know, what are people posting about? Um, what kind of comments and questions are we getting? Um, you know, really looking at what is the content that's on your page and what are you posting um, and what's the reaction to that? For example, are people saying maybe you're trying to get someone to show behavioral intent? Uh, about um, uh, being an active bystander. And so maybe you ask a question or create a poll uh, where you're trying to get people to say, basically, I will be an active bystander. Um, you can measure that. You can look at how many people said that. Um, what kind of a response did we get? You can also get comparisons over time. That's just one example. So how are things changing? How are your interactions changing? How are people's comments, beliefs, and attitudes that they're showing um, as you interact with them changing? And you can also do key stakeholder interviews, something we do a lot in all sorts of approaches. So you can specifically pick users um, so whether they're followers of yours on Twitter or whether they're um, people who like you on Facebook, 
you can find people to give you feedback just as you would about your website um, and really ask some key questions to get a sense of not only the process, do they like it, but how is it changing their behavior, their attitudes, and their beliefs. I think I want to pause there and see if there are any questions about any of that or ones that I um, was unable to get to while I was talking. I think actually you addressed all the questions, Ashley. Um, there was a comment earlier uh -huh. um, from Chad where he was mentioning something about um, when you share your posters online, you kind of do put yourself at some risk. The My Strengths campaign had been, um, I guess, Photoshop hacked. Um, oh, yeah. So that's just a consideration for having that, like, online media presence. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he was probably uh, kind of adding to the the billboard that I showed where it was basically spray-painted over, right, but kind of done through an online <laughs> way. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We always have to attend to that. and you know, prepare ourselves, what if that does happen? Can we prevent it? And what might our response be if something like that happens? Just always planning, which is the first point on this slide. So when we get to implementation, again, one of the pieces in this continuous quality improvement model that we're pulling these dots out of is to plan. Planning is so, so important. And I, I hope I've made that point throughout that we're planning everything. We're looking at who are, who are we trying to work with? Um, where do we want to see the behavior change? What behavior do we want to see change? How are we going to do it? We have to have a plan for everything, even what might go wrong. Um, and that's so that they, what we're doing as we implement it is realistic, is engaging, is current. We want to always attend to that, always make sure that folks don't think we're unrealistic. Um, that, you know, reality as the, the top picture shows is standing between you and me, or that people are pretending to listen, but they're really not. We're not engaging them. So this is, again, how we're doing it is really important, and it really incorporates the plan, planning it before we even get into how we're doing it. It's all important. We want quality, quality use of media, technology, and social networking. And what I oftentimes um, have to, to work with folks around is the idea of letting go of control. Because we have this um, tendency to, you know, we're concerned the organizational control, the message, what might happen as we put it out there. At the same time, we really use these tools to help us with this nothing for youth, youth without youth, to have the community be in the center. The community, uh, the audience, is going to really, hopefully, take charge of this, use it, shape it in a way that's going to work for them. And so that's where we are facilitators, but we have to let go of this kind of tendency to want to say, no, that's the right answer, no, we're going to use it this way, the more that we can let go and let them create something that works, the better it's going to be. And I think that, you know, that's kind of applying typical community organizing to this new online world that we have. So the next point here is revision. We can see that, as I said over and over again, things change, especially in this realm when we're talking about technology. They change rapidly. And so a key component of the continuous quality improvement model is to revise. We're testing, we're seeing if it works, we're finding out what works, what doesn't, and we're changing it to fit what we found out. So it's a circular model. We're continually implementing, testing, assessing, right, figuring out what works and what doesn't. And then we have to be open to changing so that we really are being effective. And I want to take you through one example of um, Portland Community College. So this is 
They are a rape prevention and education grantee in Oregon, and they have quite a dynamic program going on, and so I thought I'd use them as an example because they show a lot of our different options here and how we can use media technology um, and social networking as a way to promote healthy behaviors um, to, to really work to prevent sexual violence. So we'll look at those three levels again, and we'll start with the individual. So what Portland Community College is doing is uh, they are, and they've had for a while, this theater of the oppressed strategy. So these are presentations. I know um, some of you on here are definitely familiar with theater of the oppressed. But basically, it's a, it's a theater strategy that um, does presentations about sexual violence, about um, other forms of oppression, prejudice, discrimination, um, and is done in person. They also do in-class presentations. And to make it more technological, they're using video blogs as well. So all of these get at that individual level change. They're targeting attitudes, they're, um, individual attitudes and behaviors and they're using a range of strategies here that go from in-person to online. When we look at the relationship level, and now in their case, because they are a community college, we're really focusing on relationships between students, faculty, and staff amongst each other and between each other. So they have a Facebook and Twitter presence, something that was common, they, they knew, they did an assessment, they knew that's something that the students definitely used, and it was something that was really easy for them to take on um, as a tool that they could use for free. And then on a non-technological level, they have the PCC Safe Council, which is a council of students, faculty, uh, and staff who are overseeing their larger sexual violence prevention project that they're doing. Um, which is called PCC Safe, and that, that's Portland Community College Sexual Assault Free Environment. So that's the overall name of their project. And then at the community level, they have all sorts of things going on. So some of the strategies you can see that affect both the individual and relationship levels also are making community change as well um, and utilizing the community to create change. So they have a website. They have um, newspaper coverage. They're using media. They're using online technology. Um, and they're also doing things right there on campus that don't use that, like flash mobs. Um, and they have a branded club that they're using, PCC Safe. So they've branded it in a way that students want to be a part of it. Um, they have an indication that they're a part of it on their student ID. Right? They really created something that really resonates with the students, the identities they want to have, those characteristics, um, and created something that meets that. Other options that they could use, uh, they could do email groups. Maybe they could use texting uh, as a way to engage the students. Posters, uh, campus or local radio and TV. They have a lot of options here. And again, what they're using is gonna stem from not only what their capacity is, but more importantly, what they found in their assessment is going to work for the students um, whose behavior they're trying to change. So, I am going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Awesome, thanks Ashley. We actually did have a question in the chat. Um, this can go out to you and then if you don't know, we can pose it to the group and they can answer through chat. The question was, can organizations get an Instagram account and use that as a way of you know, being out there in the media? Absolutely. Uh, I've been noticing a lot of organizations doing it more. Um, some organizations like, well, one who posts all the time um, is the Keep Abreast Foundation that um, does the lovely I Love Boobies campaign. Uh, but they use, they use Instagram all the time. 
Um, they have thousands of Instagram followers. They're posting pictures constantly. But they had to look at, well, how are we going to use it? Are we just going to get it and post random pictures here and there? Um, for them, it really works. They're always at uh, Warp Tour and other festivals. They're posting pictures that people want to see. And so that gets that assessment piece as well, because I can compare it to another organization um, who has an account and posts maybe once a month. No one's using it. It's not really helping them out, right? They just need to really assess why is it that I'm going to be using this? What change am I trying to create with it? Who is the audience I'm looking at? And really will and how will this work? And then, Ashley, um, do you have, do you know, how are they doing it? Are they doing it through someone's personal phone or iPad? Oh. Or uh, maybe does the organization have a smartphone or an iPad? Um, or maybe doing it from a desktop? Um, I believe that they're doing it through uh, the iPhones. Um, I think that's the most common way to do it, is my understanding. I, I have a personal Instagram account. I always just use my phone because I take the picture with my phone. Um, so I don't know of anybody who's, who's doing it necessarily another way. I think everyone I know is doing it through, through the iPhone. And so when it comes to organizations, it brings up a good point. Who's going to manage these sites? So, um, you know, you really have to consider <laughs> who's going to be the one posting, um, you know, in terms of staff, who is the time. Um, I know that I was a part of an organization where several of us tweeted, um, so we would post to Twitter, and we had to talk about kind of organizing it. How are we going to do this? Maybe how many is each person going to do? Who's going to be the main poster? Um, should I, as a staff member, check in with my executive director before I post something to make sure it's consistent with the kind of messages um, and what we want our Twitter presence to be like? Hmm. So it sounds like um, there's a lot of similar questions you would have to ask for an assessment internally you'd have to go through to use any of these tools, really. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then we also had a question of what is Pinterest? Oh, Pinterest, okay. Um, so Pinterest is, uh, I'm sure some of you use it personally. It's very, it, it really caught on. Um, it's a site where you kinda, kinda pin things. <laughs> so you basically mark, people post pictures. Um, usually it's pictures of things that they like. And so I've seen a lot of people who are really into decorating, um, post pictures of a certain way to arrange flowers or <laughs> things like that. And they, they post it and then someone else basically takes that picture and you, in a sense, you're pinning it to your board. So you're basically sharing it with other people. You're taking what someone has shared, putting it on your Pinterest page and saying basically, hey, I like this. And only recently have organizations started using it. Uh, I think it can be a bit difficult to figure out how, especially when you're working on something like sexual violence prevention. So I'd love to hear if any of you are using it for that topic. Um, I found a lot of, say perhaps an animal rights organization might have a Pinterest account and they post cute pictures of animals and say, hey, you should rescue, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of folks using it for the work that we do. So if any of you do, I'd love to hear about it. Um, yeah, please feel free to uh, chat if you are using it. Um, and in the meantime, there was another question um, that was about Facebook. Um, the question is, does anyone have advice on using Facebook or other sites to fundraise, whether for prevention or other services? Well, Facebook definitely has advice on that. Um, <laughs> so you know, they have their causes pages, uh, which is something that folks do use. Um, it is, it is, it does cost an organization to use it. I honestly never have. Um, so, you know, go through cost benefit analysis and see if it's going to work for you. Um, I think that, you know, again, I'd love to hear if any of you are using it. Looking on here. Um, you know, it's just, Honestly, people have a lot of different opinions about whether it's worth it or not. I think a lot of the very large organizations um, use it and are able to raise a significant amount of funds. Um, I've you know, talked to some development directors and, and different folks within our movement in particular who a lot of times have felt, well, we're so small, we only have 500 likes, how are we going to raise money? 
Um, however, I have talked to fundraising council about the fact that the whole goal behind getting your likes up for folks like this individual was to be able to then start raising money with your Facebook, Facebook con constituents. So there's a whole group of folks out there who are looking at and really specializing in how you can use things like Facebook to raise money. But a key component of that is building up your Facebook presence and getting a lot of more people to follow you, to like you, in order to then use, use them, basically, um, for individual fundraising. I, that, that's a really good point, Ashley. And David really was kind of seconding what, seconding what you were saying there, um, that if you're using micro donations or individual donors, that you have to create a really great community and then ask them for money. So um, sounds like it's a lot of relationship building and building your presence before you can really use it as a fundraising tool. Um, and then he also added that Holodoc uses Indiegogo because it's cheap and easy uh, for followers and supporters to use. So there's another platform other than the causes page on Facebook which does charge you. Oh yeah, absolutely. There, there are a lot of those. Um, you know, people are lots of places. You make a video and you set a goal and you say, "I want to raise this much money," and you know, you, you go for it. <laughs> so, yeah. lots and lots of different pages for that. Um, we have another question. Um, any of these sites that involve posting pictures seem to have the added issue of um, possibly needing a release for the people who are in the photos? How do organizations address this? Well, honestly, I've heard a lot more organizations talking about it than actually doing it, having a release. Um, you know, you're talking about a, a pretty anonymous person um, who's going to be looking at these photos and sometimes posting photos to your page, which is something else to consider as well. Um, I think that in general when folks do use releases, it's just the common release that you have for your organization. Anytime you take a picture, now we're including in our release and kind of you're giving permission for this to be posted on an online site such as Facebook or our website. It's just really expanding what we already have when we are using releases for photos. That's a really good point. Um, and then so someone asked in the chat that if they have a disclaimer that their picture is taken, make them aware that it can be used for public media. That's kind of like what you were saying, Ashley. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Um, and then there was just one other comment about the fundraising piece that um, some people use Kickstarter, but there are a lot of hoops to jump through. And so um, right. someone was sharing that they've had better experience using the Indiegogo. Okay. That's good to know, and that's that's kind of the essence of what we're talking about with media and technology is let's learn from each other. What's working for us? Because this is all so new, and often in a week there's something else that's new, and so if we can learn from each other and really learn from experience, I think it's really going to help, in, especially in movements like ours, where we do tend to have, I would say, a smaller following than, say, something someone like the Humane Society who uses these things all the time, right? Or, um, you know, really everything I think of that's really, really successful with these strategies are, are outside of our movement. Because even the largest of us, um, when we look in the movement, if you compare to other types of movements, we really don't have as much of a presence, as many followers, um, and, and we're kind of up and coming <laughs> with using these tools. But we can get there. That is a really good point. Um, someone else has shared another reason not to use Kickstarter, especially for us being smaller, is that if you don't meet the goal you set, that they don't give you your money. It all gets refunded back to people, um, whereas Indiegogo gives you a break on your processing fee if you meet your goal. Um, so those are some really good considerations considering the size of most of us and, yeah, who we draw as an audience. Those are really important to consider when picking the right kind of tool. Mm -hmm. Right. I could even, um, you know, talk about I've had similar experiences with some of those fundraising by via text. So you text in a number um, to donate ten dollars. Um, similar experiences there, where it's, it's quite a cost um, and less benefit for the kind of work that we do. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we have another question in the chat. Um, if you post videos on YouTube and you use other people's songs as background music, can you cite the artist or song, or is there more copywriting issues? 
Uh, well, there have always been car copywriting issues. They've they, they've kind of gone back and forth on this. I've actually had that experience a couple of years ago where I used a song in the background and they took the video down instead of violating copyright. Now it looks like what they're doing, and I'd love to hear some of you are posting maybe more often than I do on YouTube uh, about if you've had that experience. It seems random to me, but I've seen a lot of people who just say that I do not own the music, this is what the music is, who the artist is, and those videos tend to stay up. So I don't know if you know, they're kind of, it's case by case, uh, but that's what I've been seeing lately. Exactly. Um, we've heard too from folks uh, and some experiences here with our YouTube account um, that YouTube itself will actually go in and remove the song from the video um, and post something that, like, this was removed for copyright infringement. Okay. So I'm sure they don't catch everything necessarily, but it sounds like they are kind of trying to monitor that themselves. Oh, right. That's that's absolutely true. We, um, yes, <laughs> YouTube will go in and, and change things in your account, um, change videos that you post. <laughs> and I think if you do, I don't know how many people are using Google videos, but if you post um, to Google videos, then they also um, do that as well. Thanks for that, Ashley. Um, it looks like, um, let's see, some folks are talking about their experiences with that, that you can still get fines. Um, let's see. Yeah, it looks like it's just kind of there are different ways that they're dealing with that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, and Chad has a really good point here, too, that you're, you're always violating copyright if you're using um, someone else's work without permission. And so it's, it's really just a matter of, you know, like he says here, it's a record company. They might want you to have that song up so it can get popular if it's a really viral video that's being shared a lot or something like that. So it's, it's kind, of, kind of random, I would say. <laughs> And we had some questions, so I just posted the link for the Indiegogo mm -hmm. site that some people were referencing. So you have the web link in the chat feature now. Mm -hmm. And I just, I really want to encourage everyone to really take advantage of, of your coalition, Wixap, uh, because really you all, Wixap has done a, a great job of putting, creating resources, um, doing trainings about this. Um, I, I've, I've looked at a lot of Wixap's materials and um, they're, they're definitely ones that if you haven't tapped into, if you haven't seen them, I would definitely suggest um, that you, you go ahead and, and take advantage of those. Just as a little fun aside here, one of the participants has shared um, a, a Tumblr blog that is fun and pretty relevant to our work. Um, it's antioppressivebabyanimals.tumblr.com. I'll share that link in the chat feature. Okay. It's, it, One of my favorites. Yes, it is pretty entertaining. And it's kind of a, it's a, a nice way of seeing some of our dialogue making it into the popular media. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, it's, you know, accompanied with animals, which is adorable, and some humor. But, um, you know, they are getting more followers than a lot of other ways of getting our, our message out into the, the dialogue, which is kind Absolutely. of interesting to see. I'm always, I'm always hoping that some of our organizations will be the ones to create things like this and, and get more attention. Um, there are also things like feminist Ryan Gosling and public health Ryan Gosling and <laughs> things that, you, you know, it's, it's fun to do and they can get you attention if they're done in the right way. Yeah, I think that's a good example of trying to really bank on what's popular. Yep. Um, you know, the Ryan Gosler tumblings really, really took off. Like, there became a blank Ryan Gosling for every every kind of interest. And it's this thing that caught fire um, for no really good reason, you know, other than I guess him being a big star in the spotlight, um, that other everybody wanted a piece of that, so their message got attached to that. and. I don't think that's, you know, the way to go necessarily, but I think it's one tool we have that when those things start to really become popular, see if we can't get our message in there somehow and become part of that dialogue. Even if it burns out in a couple of months, you know, it, it kind of is important to at least try to be out there where we can. Yep, absolutely. 
Um, I think those are all the questions that we had in the chat. Did you have any other closing remarks? I well, just want to encourage everybody to also go to uh, preventconnect.org. I'll type it in here uh, for even for more of our resources. Um, there we go. Uh, on on media, you can see uh, not too long ago there was um, let's see I think the most recent on media was a web conference on preventing child um, sexual abuse um, through using the media and that was done in partnership with the Ms Foundation. So we do have other resources, conferences, um, e-learning units on uh, on using media and technology, and I encourage you to check those out as well. Thanks, Ashley. And if you just want to advance to the next slide, we'll show everybody the wrap up. So thank you for joining us today on this webinar. You'll get a pop-up window with that evaluation. We ask that you please take it and we can use that to help guide our future webinars. Um, you will get an email shortly that will verify your attendance and can be used for your ongoing training hours. And if you did have other people on the call, please do send us an email so we can add that to our participant list. And thank you again for your time and joining us today. And thank you so much, Ashley, for a really great webinar. Thank you for having me. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Please stand.